Okay, well, welcome back to uh, CRT review course, part number two. And in this first slide, we'll look at some common pulmonary function uh, technique maneuvers. The first one being force vital capacity. On the exam, sometimes they ask you to either uh, correctly explain, correctly choose how to instruct a patient how to do one of these maneuvers, or they may actually define uh, the maneuver, and you have to determine which maneuver they're referring to. So a force vital capacity you should know is when you take in a very deep breath in, you inhale to total lung capacity, and then you exhale as fast as you can all the way down to your residual volume. Your peak expiratory flow maneuver is measuring the uh, how fast you can blow the air out. So you have them take a really deep breath in to total lung capacity, and then you have them uh, blow out very quickly. It's not important that they blow all the way out to RV, just that they blast their air out very fast. And the last maneuver is the maximum voluntary ventilation, or your MVV maneuver, and that's the one where you have them breathe deep in as fast as they can for about 10 to 15 seconds. Treatment of acute asthma. Asthmatics uh, are entering the emergency room. They are typically need to be treated for bronchospasm. However, those individuals could also present with uh, hypoxemia. So in addition to uh, treating the bronchospasm, you may need to treat the hypoxemia and put them on supplemental oxygen. It would not be acceptable for a young asthmatic to have a PO2 of in the low 50s on room air, so you wouldn't want to just give them a bronchodilator, you'd want to give them oxygen as well, but you could treat them with beta-adrenergic bronchodilators, Ventolin, uh, drugs of that nature, and also, uh, depending on whether or not they're going into status asthmaticus, um, or they just have a very acute um, reaction, you can put them on corticosteroids, solumedrol, or in some cases they may actually use methylxanthines. They're not used as much, the theophylin, but the test still um, asks about that. So drugs that you shouldn't be given in an acute asthmatic attack obviously are the prophylactics, such as chromium sodium, and you would not want to be delivering drugs like uh, salmuterol. Um, those are more uh, long-acting uh, and for maintenance therapy. The exam sometimes asks questions relative to vacuum pressure settings uh, for suctioning. Typically, we do not like to see the vacuum pressure exceed 120 millimeters for adults. Uh, too low of a vacuum uh, setting uh, can, can result in very poor suctioning results. So if the setting was only set, set for 60 or 70 or 50, that could be a reason why uh, you don't have sufficient vacuum to suction the secretions out of the airway. And obviously the use of a ballot catheter or an inline uh, suction catheter uh, helps to reduce the risk of contamination. It helps to reduce the um, breaking of the circuit, which would also help reduce the uh, uh, patient losing their saturation, uh, losing their PEEP that you build up in the circuit. So these are all things related to suctioning that you should be aware of. ET2 placement, you should know about uh, how do I know what the correct uh, placement of the ET tube in terms of anatomical markers and other markers that we typically use. Well, typically it's about two to see two to, <laughs> two to three centimeters above the carina. That's where the tip of the endotracheal tube should be. Another anatomical marker is at the level of the aortic knob. That's a one that's typically they like to ask on the exam. And then another one is that usually in an adult individual that the the tube should be taped somewhere around the 21 to 23 centimeter mark at the lip. So if it's at 26 or 27, that's an indication that it's too deep. If it's only at 16 or 17, then it may not be far enough. So typically 21 to 23 is, is, a, good, is a good marker. Um, and obviously the tube should be, uh, correct placement should be confirmed with an x-ray and initial assessment however is breath sounds so if the question asks you you know what what would you do initially to determine placement well the initial assessment is to try to hear 
breath sounds. If you hear no breath sounds on the left side, then typically that means that it's probably uh, in the right main stem because you know that the angle uh, is less on the on the right side. So when you put the tube in too deep, it ends up on the right side, and you lose breath sounds on the left. So what would you want to do? You would want to uh, pull the tube back, trying to get bilateral breath sounds. Incentive spirometry. Um, we use incentive spirometry most of the times uh, postoperatively uh, for surgical abdominal lung procedures. And typically, if the patient will not take a deep breath, deep breath, and cough, then they're prone to alveolar collapse and potentially pneumonia. So they should take a really deep breath in, and they should hold it at end inspiration. And this is the type of procedure that. Uh, would be ordered for uh, things such as gall bladder removal, which is a cholecystectomy, uh, lung resections, or any type of abdominal surgery would be all uh, things that you might want to order instead of spirometry for. Signs and symptoms of COPD. Um, use of accessory muscles is typically a common manifestation of patients with severe COPD and those accessory muscles such as the scalene and the sternocolloidal mastoid muscle usually indicates uh, air trapping, uh, hyperinflation, and a severe obstructive defect. Uh, cyanosis may also be present with uh, chronic bronchitis and typically results from polycythemia which is a high hemoglobin hematocrit. Barrel chest and x-rays um, typically result in a increased darkness which indicates air trapping which correlates well with the hyperinflation. Weaning parameters, we've covered this on a couple of the other slides. Uh, negative inspiratory force or NIF, uh, it's, a, it's a type of pressure manometer that connects to the endotracheal tube and it measures maximal inspiratory pressure so NIF and MIP are the same things other devices, force vital capacity, tidal volume, minute volume. Uh, you need basically some type of volume sensing device that can measure tidal volume, minute volume, and vital capacity. Typically a right thrust barometer or some type of pneumotac uh, can be used. You can also do that through any of the new modern ventilators because they have uh, built-in pneumotacs and you can put it into a spontaneous mode and you can very easily get minute volume, tidal volume, and vital capacity. Venous blood gases, don't forget about the possibility that you may end up getting a venous blood gas and sometimes the exam will ask you uh, whether or not you, you can determine that you did get a venous blood gas instead of an arterial blood gas and you should know that the venous blood gas has a slightly reduced PaO2 and a slightly reduced pH and a slightly higher PaCO2. And typically, when we say slightly reduced, it's actually significantly reduced. Your venous PaO2 is around 45, and your venous saturation is 75, and your CO2 is in the higher 40s. So you should question any gas where the values do not correlate with the patient's assessment. Uh, you would not expect a patient to be breathing comfortably if they have a PaO2 of 45, would you? So always look at the patient and correlate those values to the assessment of the vital signs and the exam will, will ask you questions giving you the vital signs, giving you a blood gas and you need to ask yourself do they correlate and there's always the possibility that venous blood was drawn instead of arterial blood. VDVT ratios uh, in, in part one we covered the um, VDT VDVT ratio formula, the Bohr equation, and we said that normal is around 30% or less, and VDVT ratios, they increase uh, typically, uh, indicates poor ventilation to uh, perfusion mismatch. Now, any peripheral lung impairment can increase the VDVT ratio. For example, emphysema can result in poor ventilation, causing the VDVT ratio to rise, and that's usually a, a diffusion defect. And severe mismatch, uh, that should say severe diffusion defect, can be seen in diseases uh, states such as pulmonary fibrosis. So uh, a VDVT ratio greater than 50% is usually indicative of a pretty severe uh, defect and uh, things such as pulmonary fibrosis or severe emphysema could be um, 
the underlying cause. Just a quick review of your ventilator alarm settings. How do you set your high pressure limit? Well, you typically set your high pressure limit somewhere between 10 to 15 centimeters above the peak airway pressure. These days, it's a little bit more narrow because we're more pressure con conscious. As far as the MBRC exams, though, 10 to 15 is still acceptable. Your low pressure limit is typically set somewhere between 20 to 15 below your peak airway pressure. Your low exhale tidal volume should be around 2 to 300 cc's below your set tidal volume. So if you have a set tidal volume of 800, uh, a reasonable low tidal volume would be 500, low tidal volume alarm. And your high respiratory rate, you don't want to set that too narrow because sometimes patients do start to breathe rapidly for a variety of reasons. But typically that's about 15 to 20 uh, above whatever your set rate is. So if your set rate is 10, um, setting a high respiratory rate of 30 is very reasonable. Now, placement of central lines, something that you may not be that familiar with at this point, but central lines uh, are also known as subclavian lines, uh, uh, CVP, or a pulmonary artery line. They're typically placed in a large central vein in the chest or neck area. Uh, one of the things you want to remember that whenever you're placing a central line that these types of lines could proliferate out of the large vein and actually puncture the subcutaneous space or the pleural space. So one of the complications of any central line placement is the possible formation of a pneumothorax. And if the scenario is that a central line is being placed and all of a sudden the person develops high peak airway pressures or a drop in blood pressure or loss of breath sounds on the affected side, then you're thinking the possibility of pneumothorax because you know that that is the number one complication, serious complication, of the placement of a central line. And it would require the placement of a chest tube. Uh, one of the other principles that the MBRC always likes to hone in on over and over again is whether or not you're providing adequate flow uh, to a ventilator circuit, to a CPAP, to a BiPAP unit, and if you have too low a flow uh, set on the ventilator or the CPAP or BiPAP unit, that could cause asynchrony. Uh, a patient could struggle to breathe and it could result in paradoxical chest movements and air hunger. So increasing the peak flow can help meet the person's inventory demands. So, so be cognizant of uh, signs and symptoms such as paradoxical chest movement, signs of air hunger, hunger, signs of asynchrony. Those could be all indicative of too low a flow rate setting or an insufficient amount of flow providing uh, providing through a uh, whether it be a CPAP mask or it could be a BiPAP device or it could even be a ventilator um, in a spontaneous mode. As far as pulmonary function quality control is concerned um, you are familiar with the 3 liter syringe and when you do use a 3 liter syringe calibration should come within 3 percent of the known syringe volume. So what that means it's a plus or minus 3 percent accuracy uh, in order for an acceptable range. So if you're using a 3 liter syringe and you're calibrating a volume displacement device then it has to be somewhere between 2.91 and 3.09 is the acceptable range. If it's not within that range, then there's a good chance that you have a leak in your pulmonary function machine. And I didn't mean to do that. I'll go back. And you have a leak in your pulmonary function machine. And therefore, either uh, you have to find that leak or you could try to recalibrate the device for accuracy again. As far as your FEV1 and FEC is concerned, um, you're supposed to do two attempts and those two attempts should correlate within 5% or around 100 milliliters difference. Um, so that's important for accuracy both with your super syringe, volume displacement, and for your FEV1 FEC. Those two things should be reproducible within a 5% range. So what does that mean if you, if you had an FEC of 4 liters? then your second FEC maneuver should be 
3.9 or so, somewhere in that, very close to the 4 liters. You should, you should not have 4 liters and then your second attempt is 2 liters, because which one would you rely on? So they need to correlate. You have to have two reproducible, reproducible maneuvers that are within 100 milliliter difference. Another um, concept is ventilator circuit compressible volume. And compressible volume uh, refers to whether the circuit is compliant, more compliant or less compliant. And obviously the more compliant a ventilator circuit is, the more volume that we lose in the tubing. And your newer disposable plastic circuits have a more rigid structure and therefore they lose less volume on inspiration into the circuit. Um, some of the older circuits which you rarely see anymore, they were non-disposable, they were more of a rubber based and they were more compliant and you lost more volume. So if you're trying to limit the loss of volume in a circuit, then you want a less compliant circuit. That's one of the reasons why uh, neonatal circuits are typically more rigid. They don't want to lose volume in that circuit and you have plastic disposable circuits um, and that helps prevent excessive volume loss. Again, when we're talking about calibrating pulmonary function devices, uh, pressure, tra pressure transducers uh, are what you need when you're trying to calibrate a pressure device. What's an example of a pressure uh, device? A, a um, mercury barometer or a water barometer. Those are the kinds of things that you would need to calibrate the pressure part of a body box. Uh, when calibrating the flow part, you need a flow transducer such as a pneumatac. And a pneumatac is a device that converts flow to volume. Endotracheal tubes, um, you, we need to make sure that we're placing the right size endotracheal tube into an individual. One of the problems that will occur is if we place too small a tube into an individual, then it would most likely take uh, too high a pressure to seal that cuff and those high pressures obviously can damage the airway so a tube that is too small could result in having too high of cuff pressures needed to prevent it from leaking. Uh, cuff pressures should really not exceed about 20 centimeters so if it requires high pressures to seal the tube then you need to consider re, re with a larger tube size. Breathing patterns, you should, you should uh, review your breathing patterns. You know that the exam typically uh, can get you on terminology and if you're not up on your breathing patterns then uh, it, this is just basic recall, it's easy to get it wrong. Things such as orthopnea, that's difficulty breathing lying flat or in a supine position. Chain Stokes breathing, periods of apnea followed by tachypnea associated with traumatic brain injury or uh, stroke. Biots respiration is basically characterized by groups of quick, shallow inspirations followed by regular or regular periods of apnea. Usually that one is related to damage to the medulla area of the brain. Um, and then there are a few others, so you would want to review all the breathing patterns uh, in the event that uh, any one of those could be uh, asked by an exam. Now, just some putting things into perspective in terms of what a large volume nebulizer is. Usually when the exam refers to large volume nebulizers, typically the ones that we use are jet nebulizers, uh, aerosol devices that we use, and typically an aerosol uh, jet nebulizer. It can power a face tent, it can, it can be used for an aerosol face mask, it can be used for a tracheostomy collar, for a T-piece. Uh, it could even be set up to be infused through an oxygen tent, um, depending on that type of setup, or an oxygen hood. And usually when they want to use an oxygen hood uh, on a baby, they're looking for something to give them a little bit more specific FiO2 as compared to, let's say, nasal CPAP, um, because the baby is actually in that enclosed atmosphere. Now, auto-peep is, uh, we talked about 
couple slides already we've talked about auto peep or intrinsic peep and that's basically peep that's undetected in the airway um, but what you need to be aware of is how you may be able to determine auto peep uh, while someone's on a ventilator well one of the maneuvers is an expiratory hold and you you put an expiratory hold and what that does is it allows the pressure to equilibrate in the airway and you would actually see the baseline pressure um, increase on the manometer as I was saying um, the auto peep will actually measure on the monitor during the expiratory hold maneuver so if you did an expiratory hold and they were on a peep of five you might actually see the peep go up to eight or nine and then you would know you have auto peep so expiratory hold is one one method the other method, it's actually a more simple method, is to look at your flow time graph on the ventilator waveform. And if you see, I, I drew it up here, you can see that above the line is inspiratory flow and below the line is expiratory flow. And, and what occurs here though is this expiratory flow should return all the way to the baseline before the inspiratory breath. And you can see that it doesn't that the inspiratory breath actually starts way down here and what that means is there's gas trapped between here and here and usually there's a calibration over here so you could actually see where it's minus you know not minus but uh, three four five eight or ten and if you were to come over here you might see that well this person has plus five trapped on the expiratory side and you can see the same thing here so when the leg when the expiratory leg on the flow waveform does not come back all the way up before the next breath then you have auto peep this little area here represents auto peep air trapping this line should come all the way up and then the inspiratory breath starts so that's an important assessment to know looking at your flow time graph and looking at the expiratory leg when it doesn't come back up you have auto peep Suctioning, just to review suctioning techniques, we should pre-oxygenate with 100% oxygen to prevent or limit uh, drops in the O2 saturation. Another, another good thing is to use the inline Ballard type suction catheters. That prevents having to break the circuit during suctioning, uh, thus maintaining uh, adequate peep levels and limiting saturation during suctioning. So if someone is desaturating while you're suctioning, you can pre-oxygenate and uh, you can uh, choose to switch to an inline suction device that you don't have to break uh, and that should help prevent that desaturation. Causes of increased air pressure in a ventilator circuit, well there's quite a few things that can cause increased air pressure in the vent circuit. Obviously bronchospasm will do it, um, secretions in the airway, uh, in the endotracheal tube, a improper placement of the endotracheal tube. If the tube starts to migrate into the right main stem, gets too far down, then your area pressures can rise. Any types of obstruction of the endotracheal tube, kinking, biting of the tube, fighting the ventilator, these are all things that can cause your area pressure to go up. And obviously pneumothorax, uh, air in the pleural space compresses the lung and therefore it can make your peak pressures rise. So sometimes you have to troubleshoot what the problem is or they might ask you multiple multiple which of the following could cause your peak airway pressure to rise in a ventilator. Again this is a reinforcement uh, treating refractory hypoxemia. You should know that the first line for treatment of refractory hypoxemia is typically the institution of PEEP because when we, we say refractory hypoxemia we're already, already assuming that we're providing oxygen and the the uh, response in PaO2 is, is refractive to that oxygen therapy. So we may need to continue to titrate the PEEP until a sufficient level results in adequate oxygenation. And so it's not uncommon to put them on 5 a PEEP, 10 a PEEP, 12, even 15 a PEEP in order to we get, in order to we reach a level that provides the oxygenation that we're seeking. Uh, however, if the blood pressure or the cardiac capture falls significantly, then we're going to have to consider decreasing the PEEP level. So again, instead of increasing FO2, we're going to increase PEEP uh, to a certain level uh, until we're satisfied with the oxygenation level unless the blood pressure or cardiac capture falls 
significantly. Auto cycling, uh, I'm sure you're familiar, it's when a ventilator basically uh, initiates a breath all by itself uh, in the face of no patient effort. And typically, the most common reasons why the ventilator would auto cycle would be probably the sensitivity is too sensitive. There could be something wrong with the machine, but if you set the sensitivity to zero, which is the most sensitive setting, then obviously the ventilator, every time the needle comes back down to zero, it's going to cause a breath. So one of the ways you may be able to determine that the ventilator is auto cycling is if you have them set, let's say at a set rate of 10 and they're in assist control mode and they're not breathing at all, meaning that they're, they're apneic, you, you look at them and you see that they have no effort and the ventilator is giving you a rate of 25, then obviously the ventilator is cycling by itself and that shouldn't occur. If they're in assist control mode of 10, then if they're in a rate of 25, then you should actually be able to see uh, an effort by them of 15 times per minute. So you do have to look out for auto cycling because sometimes the ventilator will auto cycle or if there's something wrong with the flow mechanics of the ventilator, uh, the microprocessor, it could cause the machine to auto cycle. The PFT graphs, we covered this in pulmonary function uh, and we talked about um, the slope of the line. I had mentioned this to you all about the slope of the line is that the, the steeper the slope of the line on a volume time graph, and this is a volume time graph, volume going up on the vertical, time on the horizontal, but the steeper the slope of the line it indicates a better flow rate. The less the slope, okay, then the flow rates are lower. So you can see that in B, this person, they both, they both end up with the same volume okay however the difference here is the slope of this line this person has much more greatly reduced flow rates and this person has uh, better flow rates if you're doing this as a comparison study and let's just say this was the first maneuver B actually being the first maneuver in this case and you gave them a bronchodilator and the result was A well, you have a significant increase from B to A in terms of flow rates. So this would represent some reversibility of airflow obstruction. Again, the volume time graph is not the optimal graph that we would use. We'd rather use a flow volume loop, but if that's all they're giving you is volume time, pay close attention to the slope of the line and the changes. If it didn't change at all and B and A were almost the same slope, then you would say that this was an irreversible uh, airway obstruction. Uh, the exam will ask you about placement of leads uh, of a 12 lead EKG, so you need to just um, study these and know the places. They're, they're fairly simple in terms of where they go, but this is straight memorization and I would uh, review these and make sure that you know exactly where they are in relationship to midclavicular line or midaxillary line. Non-invasive ventilation, which is a very common form of ventilation that we use. However, there are some issues with non-invasive ventilation. One of them is that we have to make sure that the mask is properly fitted. And it takes time to, to make sure that the mask is properly fitted. Um, one of the things that uh, you need to realize is that if the mask is not properly fitted with the spacers, it will result in leaks. If it results in leaks around the mask, then obviously you're not going to be able to maintain the set pressure settings that you want, either inspiratory or expiratory. Um, the other thing is NG tubes. If they have an NG tube in and you're trying to place the, a non-invasive mask on there, it could result in a source of leak. Or if the mask itself is loose, the head straps become loose or they're not fitted properly, then that also can result in the desired pressures not being met. Chest tubes, you're, you're probably not very familiar with chest tubes. However, um, there is a water seal chamber uh, in the chest tube unit and the idea of that is to allow gas to escape out of the lungs, but for the gas not to be able to suck back in the lungs. So there's just a basic water seal. It's very similar to putting a straw in a glass of water and blowing out through the straw. The air will break the water and release. If you suck back in though, you will not get any air, you'll get water. So what you need to know 
for this exam for chest tubes is that in the water seal it's it's normal for a, a natural fluctuation up and down however in the water seal there should be just some gentle bubbles there should be some small bubbling you should not see uh, vigorous bubbling whenever you whenever a situation defines vigorous bubbling in the water seal then you want to remember that that's a leak so there's a leak somewhere in the unit if you have lots of bubbling in the water seal the other principle about chest tubes is that they all drain by gravity drainage that means that the chest tube unit itself has to be below the patient's chest level if you take a whole chest set, unit set and put it on their bed then it's not going to it's not going to drain properly so the chest tube unit needs to be hung down below their bed just a quick review of some of the drugs uh, that you should know and obviously you should know a lot more than this but these may be a few that uh, you just need a quick review on one of them is ribavirin and you know that's used to treat uh, respiratory syncytial virus using in pediatrics and they use a spag for that pentamidine is typically given to aerosolized to AIDS patients and it's used to treat a pneumocystis carinae pneumonia racemic epinephrine is used to treat strider Ricuronium is used for muscle blockade, uh, totally relax someone, i.e. almost paralyze them on the ventilator. Anectine is used for uh, short, short term, it's a, it's a short term paralytic. Uh, three to five minutes used for intubation, primarily for intubation. It's also known as succinylcholine. And intol is used as an asthma preventative, also known as crumlin sodium. Well, that's the end of the CRT review session number two. There is a session three, a addendum to number two with some other summary information, and I will add that to the YouTube video. I added my picture in case you wanted to see the face behind the voice, and I hope these uh, videos are uh, helping you and benefiting you in your respiratory programs or helping you with your passing your national boards.